Hello, I'm Michael, and I'll be doing a stop-and-go extended description of this award ceremony. A gold line frames the screen. Over a starry night sky background, bold white text appears. Pegasus Awards 2021. A logo for the Poetry Foundation sits nestled atop a cloud. Thin lines animate to connect a group of twinkling yellow stars into a constellation. A gray etching of a Pegasus horse appears, rearing on its hind legs, wings outstretched. When the program begins, the text, logo, and constellation are wiped away and replaced with two gold-outlined video windows. A small window in the lower left corner contains American Sign Language interpretation. This ASL window persists throughout the program, as do open captions, which appear centered at bottom. A large window dominates the center of the screen. Here, the main speakers appear and address viewers directly. This central video window gives way at times to various graphic layouts set against the starry background. Headshot photographs and name IDs, quotations in bold white text, and messages congratulating or announcing winners. At times, poets read aloud their own compositions. They appear on the left, while the text of their poem appears at right. Each verse of poetry is outlined in a red rectangle as the poet reads. This rectangle moves down line by line through the written text until the screen is refreshed with new stanzas of poetry. The official program will now begin. Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Pegasus Awards, the Poetry Foundation's annual celebration of poets. I'm Michelle T. Boone, president of the Poetry Foundation. My pronouns are she, her. I am an African-American woman wearing a pink floral dress and I'm also wearing glasses. We're so excited to celebrate our award winners and the poetry community tonight. We've all been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and want to acknowledge the toll it has taken on writers, readers, educators, parents, and the many others that make the world of poetry vibrant. It's been a long year of uncertainty, resilience, reckoning, and accountability. We here at the Poetry Foundation are continuing our journey to make our organization and programs more inclusive, accessible, and equitable. And we cannot wait to welcome you in person again soon. This welcome message takes place in a double height library space, filled floor to ceiling with books. Some display shelves feature poetry books and framed magazines. During the upcoming land acknowledgement, the Poetry Foundation building is highlighted with its modernistic zinc and glass structure and its transparent enclosed garden. We'd like to begin by acknowledging that the Poetry Foundation building is situated on the occupied original homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and Odawa nations, among other indigenous nations. Indigenous people continue to live here today, and Chicago is home to one of the largest urban indigenous communities in the United States. We gather, recognizing that some of us are settlers on colonized land, and that this land acknowledgement is one small part of disrupting and dismantling colonial structures in which we are living. Now, I'd like to throw it to our host for this evening, Charles Andrew Gardner. Born and raised on Chicago's South Side, Charles is an actor, educator, and filmmaker, and you may have seen him recently on shows like The Shy and Chicago PD. He's also president of the Chicago local SAG-AFTRA, and we are grateful to have him as our host tonight. Take it away, Charles. Charles speaks from inside the Poetry Foundation building with the garden in view in the background. Hey, and thanks, Michelle, and hello to all of you watching tonight. My name is Charles Andrew Gardner. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a black male with brown eyes, and I'm wearing an indigo blue suit and a powder blue shirt. And I'm recording from the lobby of the Poetry Foundation. 
As an actor, I always have had a love for language. And as the president of the Chicago local chapter of SAG-AFTRA, I am excited to be honoring and celebrating tonight's award recipients. Now, although we aren't gathered here in person, the power of the poetry community is palpable even on a virtual platform. This past year, through dozens of online readings, workshops, social media and blog posts, podcasts, and much, much more, you have proven that the poetry can still be created, experienced, and loved in a virtual setting. We dedicate this ceremony to all of you, poets and readers, writers and artists, teachers and students, editors and critics, publishers, librarians, parents, and you who make the world of poetry so vibrant, impactful, and important. Let's cover some accessibility notes. To turn on captioning, find the CC icon at the bottom of the video window. Captions will show up next to the ASL interpreter's video. To the right of the screen, you'll find the live chat box where you can give our award winners all the virtual snaps and love they deserve. Take a moment to type into the chat where you are watching from tonight. A prompt appears on screen. Where are you watching from tonight? You can also use the chat box to ask any technical questions as Poetry Foundation staff will be on hand to assist. Tonight, we celebrate the accomplishments of contemporary rock stars in poetry. Headshots of two women appear. Patricia Smith will be honored with the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize and Susan Briante with the Pegasus Award for Poetry Criticism. A new layout of five headshots. Brian Birdlong, Stephen Espada Dawson, Natasha Rao, Nor Hindi, and Simon Shea will be recognized as this year's Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellows. Our program features readings and remarks from this year's winners, as well as tributes from other poets, collaborators, and colleagues in recognition of their contributions to poetry. Before we honor this year's awardees, we want to take a moment to give a special shout out to our current Young People's Poet Laureate, Naomi Shihabnai. Headshot of Naomi. Naomi received this two-year title in 2019. In light of the council readings due to the pandemic, her tenure has been extended to 2022. Naomi is an acclaimed children's writer whose writing moves seamlessly between ages in a way that is accessible, warm, and sophisticated, even for the youngest of readers. A self-described wandering poet, she inspires curiosity and wonder as a writer and as a teacher. Don't miss her two new books, Everything Comes Next, Collected, and New Poems. Cover art of a hand planting a flower into the pages of an open book. The flower's stem is a pencil and cast away, poems for our time. Cover art filled with bright, everyday objects, adrift in a watery blue background. And now, without further ado, it's time to celebrate this year's Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellows. Let's welcome Emily Jung Min Yoon, a member of the 2017 Fellows class, who will introduce this year's winners. Hello everyone, my name is Emily Jungmin Yoon. I am a poet. I am a cisgender East Asian woman with long brown hair. I am wearing a light green knit top. I'm sitting in front of a gray couch and a black printer on top of a white side table. It is my pleasure to introduce you to this year's Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellows. Founded in 1989, the fellowship is intended to encourage the further study and writing of poetry. Applications are open to all U.S. poets between 21 and 31 years of age. Check out the link in the chat for a full list of this year's fellowship finalists. Now let's meet this year's fellows and hear some of their work. Quoted text from the selection committee. The poems in Brian Birdlong's Strange Flowers Project excavate the zombie figure and its resonances in African-Haitian folklore, as well as American pop culture. In Birdlong's dexterous and capable hands, the undead provokes an Afro-pessimist meditation on Black social death. Hi, my name is Brian Birdlong. I'm a Black cisgender male, he, him pronouns. Uh, my hair is up in twists. I have a beard. 
uh, wearing a gray t-shirt and jean jacket. Uh, behind me is a white wall background. This is Black Zombie. Lines of poetry appear. I feel most like a zombie after drinking a cocktail. Two parts dark rum, one part OJ, a splash of grenadine, orange slice. I feel most like a zombie when consuming a leg from Popeye's, chicken fried rice, lip grease smear. That one episode of Key and Peel where the ghouls flee from them wide-eyed, hustle over a wooden fence. I be there cold by the grill, they're unbothered in the backyard, a walking infomercial. I bear a bag of trash and call it glad, limp on a twisted ankle that will never heal. I feel most like a zombie when I see red and blue lights in the rear view, when I hear hands up. I am most like a zombie when I'm out on the street after they have killed another one of us. By us, I mean a second cousin once removed. By us, I mean we who spirited here in droves, we who moan death rattle, build a base that could break stained glass. Our state has trouble separating from our church, so I sing stomp, chew a piece of Christ flesh, drink his blood with a slice of cucumber outside a courthouse with the jurors they refuse. I feel most like a zombie waking up to a hangover, my T-bone ange buzzing in my pocket. One text leads, I want to be most honorable judge, mystical black. Another reads, let me know when you get home safe. I don't respond with words. I am well beyond words now. I feel most human when surrounded by people who are only there in spirit. I feel most human when they pull my water from the ground, pour me into a tej, two parts water, one part honey. I feel most human when they hold the white wine, add some barbancourt, small saucepan, low flame. When the stirring has stopped, when the strainer has given its last drop, I offer them something to drink. Thank you. I'm so stunned by how the zombie figure transforms throughout the poem from pop culture references to the ultimately heartbreaking ending. Thank you so much, Ryan. Quoted text from the selection committee. Even Espada Dawson's poems portray loss and what will soon be lost, reminding us to value who is here with us now, a sense of love and wonder threads through each detail. My name is Steven Espada Dawson. I'm a poet and teaching artist. I take he, him pronouns. I am a Mexican American man with glasses and a full shirt. I am sitting by a bookshelf and a wall with plants and pictures. This is my poem, A River is a Body Running. Lines of poetry appear. The first time I found my brother overdosed, he looked holy, a thing not to be touched, yellow halo of last night's dinner, his skin blanched blue fresco, patron saint of smack, a cop flustered, tugged up his shorts, plunged a needle into a pale thigh. He hissed awake like a soda can. The paramedic spoke slowly in his ear like a lover, asked him what color yellow and red make. What is the difference between a lake and a river? In the corner, I whittle my brother's used syringe into an instrument only I can play. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for this masterful balance between tenderness and horror. Quoted text from the selection committee. Noor Hindi's unapologetically Arab queer and feminist voice inventively spans a range of forms, reminding us that poetry is a genre of resistance. Hi. My name is Noor Hindi. I'm a poet and reporter, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently sitting in a room with 
two mirrors behind me wearing a red blazer and the title of the poem I'm going to be reading is Fuck Your Lecture on Craft, My People Are Dying. Lines of poetry appear. Colonizers write about flowers. I tell you about children throwing rocks at Israeli tanks seconds before becoming daisies. I want to be like those poets who care about the moon. Palestinians don't see the moon from jail cells and prisons. It's so beautiful, the moon. They're so beautiful, the flowers. I pick flowers for my dead father when I'm sad. He watches Al Jazeera all day. I wish Jessica would stop texting me happy Ramadan. I know I'm American because when I walk into a room, something dies. Metaphors about death are for poets who think ghosts care about sound. When I die, I promise to haunt you forever. One day, I'll write about the flowers like we own them. Thank you, Noor. I remember seeing this poem circulate widely on social media when it first came out. It amazed many people, including myself, for its fierce clarity while speaking on devastation. Quoted text from the Selection Committee. Natasha Rao's poems are playful, lyrical, and give attention to the sonic materiality of language. Rao's honest soul-searching is magnetic and surprising to witness, an eco-poetics that feels fresh and nuanced. Hi, uh, I'm Natasha Rao. I am a poet. I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm wearing a black t-shirt and I'm sitting in a bright apartment in Brooklyn with plants and a bookshelf. This poem is called What It Was Like. Lines of poetry appear. We had sushi that was so fresh we blushed. Every 17 years, the cicadas rasped a kind of warning showed us with increasing urgency the need to leave our old bodies behind. I thought I could make some kind of difference. I thought I could memorize enough facts to stay composed in debates and not cry after one glass of wine when my brother says, we can all just go to Mars. I thought what I did was forgivable in the grand scheme of things, that your love was an inexhaustible resource. Terrible people made terrible decisions. Good people made terrible decisions. Which was I? It depended on the color of light in the bathroom, the angle at which I held my face to the mirror. I lived in a city at sea level. Sea level-headed now, the frailty underfoot. We pretended not to notice. We loved receiving shipments to our home ceremoniously slashing packages with scissors, cleaving, leaving nothing but confetti. It was like sitting across from you at dinner and wondering when to tell you, knowing the worst is coming and simply ordering another drink. Meanwhile, the bubbles in the glass keep rising. It was luxurious. It was inevitable. It was a thick piece of fatty tuna, brimming with mercury, somehow effortless to swallow. Thank you. I love these long, lush lines. Every line feels luxurious and inevitable, as you wrote, Natasha, while being surprising in its weaving of the themes of regret and love. Thank you, Natasha. Quoted text from the Selection Committee. Simon Che incorporates surreal feelings and imagery into his interrogation of political struggle, persecution, and isolation, a unique and superbly executed lens through which readers can experience his work. Hi, my name is Simon Che. My pronouns are he, him. I am a Taiwanese-American man, bald, wearing a black shirt and a gray jacket. Behind me are a white bed frame and a brown door and a white wall. I'm going to read a poem called Kindness Comes Too Easily to Wicked Men. Lines of poetry appear. In every ballroom, he is the chandelier. No, 
He is the song that everyone only knows the chorus of. Beautiful, relentless. He dresses as a dead soldier every Halloween. In the army, he says, you are dirt under the nails of your country. My mother wants him dead. The family of a young girl wants him dead. In the pockets of his old fatigues, a torn zodiac and a rusted metal spoon. Never in my life did I believe I knew him. Once, in a fit of rage, he named every star in the sky after a dead man. Premature blessing. One night, in a Taiwan hospital, a man cut my mother open and took my body out. Deliverance. Years later, she will tell me, we never remember the men who we cannot forget. He gave me a necklace of teeth. He laughs each time someone says the word God. Every day I guess his favorite color, and every day I get it wrong. Mercy, sweet throat. Mercy, blackbird. He once wrote a song about me in the middle of the night. When I sing it, a black snake slithers from my mouth. Thank you. I really appreciate how this poem is visualized gorgeously swinging across the page in the Like a Chandelier. Thank you, Simon. Congratulations again to this year's Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellows. Your work is truly incredible and important. Thank you. Photos of all five fellows reappear and then fade. A message appears in white text. Congratulations, fellows. Congratulations once more to this year's Poetry Fellows. Check the chat and the video description below for links to the fellows' work. We hope you continue to support them. Now it's time to honor the critics. Literary critics can contextualize and cast light on the importance of a poet's work, life, and archives. Great critics shape our understanding of our culture but also our understanding of ourselves. The Pegasus Award for Poetry Criticism, first awarded in 2014, recognizes the best book of literary criticism published in the previous calendar year. This could be a biography, essay collection, or other critical books on the subject of poetry. This year's finalists were Cover Art, a black and white photo of a woman who speaks at a microphone against a bright green background. Audre Lorde, Dream of Europe, Selected Seminars and Interviews, 1984 to 1992, edited by Myra Rodriguez Castro. Quoted text from the selection committee. An important addition to the canon of Lorde's work and influence, this collection of lectures, Performances and priceless Q&As present Lord as educator and speaker in the intimate environment of the classroom. It's an opportunity to look at Lord from a detailed perspective, tapping into both her processes as an educator and a writer. Reading through the collection feels like you're a student as well. Cover art, a painted portrait of a man by the artist Modigliani. And our second finalist, Max Jacob, A Life in Art and Letters by Rosanna Warren. Quoted text from the selection committee. Warren's attention to scholarly detail alongside playful anecdotes creates the fullest picture to date of Jacob's many facets and passions, which, like his friend's development of Cubist painting, cohere into a sum larger than their parts. Cover art, a neon orange color field with vertical cyan stripes. And the winner of this year's Pegasus Award for Poetry Criticism is Susan Briante for her book, Defacing the Monument, published by Noemi Press. Congratulations, Susan. Let's welcome poet Daniel Brzezutski to say a few words about Susan and the book. Hi, I am Daniel Brzezutski. I am in my home in Chicago. I'm wearing a dark blue shirt and sitting in my office on a red couch. 
I knew Susan Briante's poetry before I knew her criticism. Susan's 2016 book, The Market Wonders, is one of my favorite collections of poetry of these last few years. Defacing the monument, the critical accomplishment we are celebrating today, exemplified for many readers a new way of both writing criticism and a new way of demonstrating how a deep engagement with the literature that is most important to you can be accomplished through both analytical rigor and personal exploration. Defacing the Monument examines some of the most important literary questions of our day. How do we write about other people? How do we write about violences and traumas we have not experienced? How do we write about social violence, racial violence, state violence? And how do we think about our own complicity and responsibility without shying away from it, without retreating into cynicism or silence? For this and for so many reasons, I admire Susan Briante's work as a poet, translator, activist, teacher, and as one of our most important chroniclers of this literary moment. I'm thrilled to see her book receive this prestigious recognition and can't wait to see what Susan will write and publish in the future. Now, a few other collaborators will discuss more about Susan and her brilliant work. Against a neon orange color field, bright cyan stripes rise vertically and undulate in waves. Colored text appears, defacing the monument by Susan Briante. A video tribute follows, featuring visuals that include quotes and graphics from Briante's book, views of the desert landscape at the U.S.-Mexico border, and photos of Briante with diverse students and collaborators in the field and in classrooms. When the topic is raised of undocumented workers, close-up scans of legal documents, redactions, and signatures flash on screen, showing phrases such as illegal entry, criminal, guilty, and more. The tribute includes testimonials by the following five individuals, in order of appearance. Susie F. Garcia, Executive Editor, Noemi Press. Douglas Kearney, Graphic Designer, Defacing the Monument. Raquel Gutierrez, Poet, Writer, Critic, Educator. Carmen Jimenez-Smith, Publisher, Noemi Press. Joanna Williams, Executive Director, Kino Border Initiative. Susie F. Garcia begins. Susan Briante's Defacing the Monument weaponizes documents surrounding migration in the United States to unravel the stories behind the system. Douglas Kearney. This book is largely documenting the experiences of people who live along the border, particularly those who are hoping to cross. Raquel. It is prose, it is poetry, it is the panoply of documents. Carmen. It's a memoir of a writer who is taking into consideration her positionality and thinking about living on the U.S.-Mexico border. Susie. She's trying to open the conversation about how can we relate to these people as individuals instead of this large mass that the media would like us to see. She writes from the position of a white woman who has an academic position, so is able to move very easily between the U.S. and Mexico that was something that she was very aware of. Joanna. I'm the executive director of the Kino Border Initiative, um, which actually appears many times in Susan's book. She would bring her students down to be present to migrants in Nogales, Mexico, to know that the folks who are at the border are more than just their challenges. There's so many ways in which migrants and experiences of people who are, who are in migration are reduced down to pieces of paper. She began attending the trials of undocumented workers and being horrified at the legal language, the legal strategies that were being used to make this population illegal and criminal. She discusses how people come in groups of three or four before the court. Each ceremony is not individualized. It's just a yes or no situation. Instead of becoming intricate, multi-layered stories, we just get single cutout sheets that explain where they traveled from, where they are being held. Defacing the Monument is both a book that teaches and a book that confesses about documentary poetics. 
Susan says, how do I approach documentary poetics in a way that is anti-racist, that is ethical, that doesn't take on the burdens of another community and then profit off of them? At its core, documentary poetics is a sense of looking beyond the lyric subjectivity, the central speaker, and using materials, perspectives, documents, photographs to deepen one's relationship to the subject. The visuals in the book are really important. She really wants to think about how documents erase personhood and how we can give personhood back through those same documents. The manuscript that Susan provided was so rich with graphical ideas. Susan wanted to use formatting that was reminiscent of a workbook. Then this book became something that I could imagine the author inviting people to write into, inviting people to mark. Something that's fairly typical in magazines, but generally less so in poetry, to have phrases in the text larger. You can think about them as pull quotes, like as if I was, were underlining something and saying like this phrase here. It was really about exactly what we would do to a document, pulling and highlighting it and changing it just a little bit so that you may read it one way the first time and then read it again the second time. It really asks the reader to trust, to come in with the writer and collaborate on meaning making. A person is more than their experience of migration. A person is more than the pieces of paper. That, that document them. We're invited to find the small ways and the big ways in our lives that we can live out that firm and persevering determination to commit ourselves to the common good. Poetry is the start. Poetry is the conversation. Poetry can be the spark, but if you let it die, you're not doing enough. The action isn't making the art. The art is what inspires the action. So is reading the book enough? No any more than I would imagine Susan Briante feels that writing the book was it. What I'm hoping that people will, will walk away with is this sense of discomfort and therefore this need to act. Poetry reframes the document. It removes it from its mundane, oftentimes cruelly banal bureaucratic space and it moves it into this space where we are expecting juxtaposition, illumination, tension, undercutting. She's always challenging herself to say, well, is this enough? <laughs> what, what would it look like for me to, to affect change uh, in a more dramatic way? She's always inviting herself to go to push further, which I think in turn invites the reader to push further and invites us to go deeper into our journey. Uh, so I think she's well deserving of this extraordinary honor. A message appears in white text. Congratulations, Susan Briante. My name is Susan Briante. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a cis woman wearing a khaki shirt and blue plaid blazer, sitting before a blue wall with a painting and plant in the background. Thank you, Daniel Borzewski, for that introduction. And thank you to the Poetry Foundation and its panel of judges for this honor. I'm so grateful to be in the company of this year's other finalists and to share this recognition with them. In the summer of 2017, I began going to the US-Mexico border with grad students from the University of Arizona to write about environmental and social justice issues, including immigration. Moved by the testimony of the migrants I visited with at the Kino Border Initiative's Comedor, or Outreach Center, and the sight of shackled migrants sentenced in mass for the felony crime of illegal entry at an Operation Streamline hearing, I wanted to write about what I had heard and seen. But a series of ethical questions began to come up for me and our grad students around the act of telling other people's stories the role of witnessing, and the ethics of the documentary project. In defacing the monument, I turned to the work of poets and documentarians who provided a series of potential models and methods 
for how to approach these issues. I'm indebted to the legacies of writers like Muriel Ruckheiser and James Agee, who expanded the possibilities for documentary forms, and mentors such as Brenda Hillman and C.D. Wright, whose documentary projects and activism inspired me. I'm incredibly grateful to Banu Kapil, Laylee Long Soldier, M. Norbese Philip, and Kathy Park Hong, among others whom I include in this book. I hope my readings have done justice to their art. I want to thank the participants in the Southwest Field Studies in Writing program and my colleagues at the University of Arizona's Creative Writing MFA for supporting this work. Defacing the Monument would not have existed without the brilliant team at Noeme Press, and I extend my deepest appreciation to Susie Garcia, Sarah Zemsky, Douglas Kearney, and Carmen Jimenez-Smith for their work, support, and vision. I offer my love and gratitude to my partner, Fareed Matuk, and our, Deanna, and our daughter, G. It's an honor to think and write and live with you. Finally, I want to send my heartfelt thanks to those organizations working tirelessly and with endless creativity to provide aid and advocacy to migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border under constantly changing and always challenging conditions. I have donated 50% of my royalties from this book to the Kino Border Initiative and will continue that practice. In addition, tonight I'm happy to share with them and other organizations working on the U.S.-Mexico border 50% of the Pegasus prize money. The poets and artists I write about in Defacing the Monument are a testament to the vital intersection of art and justice. The work of organizations such as the Kino Border Initiative provide us with an important reminder that our activism should never remain exclusively on the page. And now, I'll read a selection from Defacing the Monument. In the fifth floor apartment that serves as a migrant women and children's shelter in Nogales, Sonora, an 18-year-old girl who wants to see her father, a woman from Central America who left under death threat, a mother who fled an abusive relationship and now needs to make money to support her children and grandchildren, and an 80-year-old, who wants to cross into Nogales, Arizona for the eighth time so she can sell paletas from a pushcart. A nun prods them into telling their stories to us, four women and one man visiting from a creative writing program at a state university just an hour north of them. The eldest woman stands, raising her hand as if testifying or praying. She says, when the first President Bush came into office, he tried to make life hard for migrants, but we rose up, she explains, and stopped him. She says, as soon as she can, she will go back to the popsicle factory, to her boss. She tells us her boss's name and address, says, a bo says her boss will give her a card to help her stay as soon as she can get back. And the woman who fled her country under death threat says, we want peace. Decades of US policies and interventions in Central America that favor business interests over the majority of the population, that export gang members and failed anti-gang policies must feel like a long, dirty war. Do you feel better when you tell these stories? One of us asked. And the woman does not answer, just keeps telling her story. We are teaching them to make earrings. The nun explains as she brings us into another room and shows us beaded jewelry, row upon row, each piece a little memorial to every woman who has come through the shelter. What did the nun tell them about our presence or what we might be able to do for them? Were they told we could help? 
were they told we could help before the end of their two-week stay at the women's shelter, after which they would have to find their way north or back from where they came? Were they told some other faulty equation of voice and change, some scrawl of hope, like a flight of sparrows stalling and diving without knowing whose house they alight upon? What did we think we could do? Every summer for the past three, I've gone to Nogales, Mexico with students from the University of Arizona's MFA in Creative Writing. In each summer, as we bear witness to conditions migrants face, we wonder, how can we amplify voices without turning other people's stories into commodities, without reaffirming the faulty myth of giving voice? We do not want to reduce the struggles of the migrants we meet to mere human interest stories. We know that writing will not be enough. The change necessary to improve the migrant women's lives feels utterly available and beyond any single transaction. We will work hard, the women tell us. Do you have bracelets? We eventually ask. Thank you. Congratulations again, Susan. Now we'd like to hear from you all in the chat. We'll also drop a link to purchase Defacing the Monument. And now it's time to award the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize in recognition of the poet's lifetime achievement. The Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, established in 1986, is an opportunity to revisit a poet's work as well as appreciate their legacy and impact on poetry and the world. A headshot appears. This year, we are honored to present the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize to Patricia Smith. Congratulations. Let's welcome poet Denez Smith to say a few words about the recipient of the 2021 Lilly Prize. My name is Denez Smith. I'm a poet. My pronouns are they, them. I am a Black, masculine-looking, non-binary person with a Black curly afro. I'm wearing a Black and yellow pattern shirt. Behind me are pictures and photographs and a brown door, white walls, and a Black armoire. I first met Patricia Smith when I was around 18 or 19 in Madison, Wisconsin. Myself and some other young poets were crying and laughing and marveling and growing in the front row, watching her read poems from what would become the collection Blood Dazzler, her first collection not nominated for the National Book Award. Patricia was so generous with everything she offered to the subjects in those poems, even as they were ravaged by the storm, even the storm itself was offered voice and tenderness, and we were transformed by hearing those poems for the first time. More transformed were we by Patricia's mentorship. After that reading, she gave us her Facebook and her email and told us to keep in touch. And she really meant it. When we wrote her, she wrote back. She would answer questions about poetry, critique work, offer a kind word. Patricia Smith is that kind of poet. And I know I'm safe in saying that I'm not the only poet who would not be who we are or where we are today if it was not for Patricia Smith's guidance, for her leadership, for her mentorship, for her mothering, and also by her example. God damn, she is a poet. <laughs> Patricia Smith is one of our greatest innovators, one of our greatest documentarians, one of our greatest examples of what to do with the personal narrative and how can we, we can remember all of our memories. But most of all, I know for me, Patricia is a nurturer, somebody I call my poetry mom. She is a marvel. She is our Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn Brooks, that Chicago girl who also walked alongside all the young poets, Patricia Smith is that, always learning, always listening, always laughing, always taking care of us. And wow, a master poet, one of the best poets we have writing today. Patricia Smith is that for us. Patricia, we love you. I love you. We celebrate you. And it is only right that you, a West Side girl, would win the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize. I hope you use it good. I hope you feel loved and honored today. You poet, you novelist, you everything who just keeps on going and going. And now, a few other poets and collaborators are going to tell you about Patricia's life and work. And after that, we will hear from the poet herself and hear her read from her wonderful, wonderful catalog. Congratulations again, Patricia, we love you. 
Poet Terence Hayes opens by reading a poem that is visualized graphically in bold yellow text of varying sizes and styles. A similar treatment is later given to an archival performance by Patricia Smith of her poem Skinhead. Bold white words pop and slide onto screen in rhythm with her spoken performance and in typographic layouts that reflect her delivery. During the tribute, the covers of two books by Patricia Smith are highlighted. Life According to Motown features a sepia-toned photograph of a young black girl in a white dress. Blood Dazzler features a weather map of Hurricane Katrina with the book's title placed at the swirling center. An embossed foil seal reads, National Book Award Finalist. Throughout, the tribute features photographs of Smith with a microphone at various poetry slams and readings, performing on stage at the Green Mill in Chicago, next to a guitar musician, in front of a public mural. In these photos, Smith's hands are often raised expressively, her mouth enunciating mid-word, and her eyes often closed. This video tribute includes testimonials by the following five individuals, in order of appearance. Terence Hayes, poet. Tahemba Jess, poet. Mark Smith, Poetry Slam founder. Mahogany Brown, poet, writer, organizer, Lincoln Center's first poet-in-residence. Kwame Dawes, poet, writer, editor, professor. Terence Hayes begins. Smith is a common surname among 2.4 million mostly African-American Americans. You are likely some kin to a Smith. You may feel like someone floating in a swimming pool animated by lightning reading Smith. It may feel like someone has kissed your scalp to instigate time travel. So when I wrote this poem for her birthday, there is a passage in it when I'm really trying to describe what it's like to read a Patricia Smith poem animated by lightning. The name Patricia Smith is spelled out letter by letter in typewriter font. A portrait photo of Smith, whose piercing gaze fixes on the camera. To him, to Jess. Back in Chicago in the mid to early 90s, I ran across Patricia at the famous, infamous Green Mill Poetry Slam. Patricia's from the West Side. She testifies to that kind of grit and that kind of enthusiasm and life that she was able to find growing up on the west side of Chicago. Back in the day, you know, uh, Slam was very, very new. Uh, Mark Smith was the guy who started the Green Hill. They started as a kind of an effort to bring poetry back from the ivory tower. When Patricia Smith hit the stage, the crowd would be magnetized. If she's able to reach into different personas, see into the core of what really makes America and human beings tick. Mark Smith. The Poetry Slam was and still has been all those all these years, was the doors are open to everybody. Not only Patricia's, but most all of us at the beginning, our style was we're talking right to you on the street or in the kitchen. Mahogany Brown. And you, you rarely see someone who has the capability of having a piece, one piece be that kind of universal tool, no matter where you're from. When she's done reading her piece, you find yourself in that piece. I was taught that poetry only lived in a specific body, in a specific voice, which usually um, it had nothing to do with uh, being black and woman. And when I saw her first piece, Skinhead, and then Medusa, everything in my life changed after seeing her perform these pieces because here you have this moment where she gave humanity to such a monstrosity. They call me Skinhead, and I got my own beauty. It is knife scrawled across my back in sore, jagged letters. It is in the way my eyes snap away from the obvious. I sit in my dim matchbox on the edge of a bed tousled with my ragged smell, slide razors across my hair, count how many ways I can bring blood closer to the surface of my skin. These are the duties of the righteous, the ways of the anointed. When you can see yourself through those really ugly and uncomfortable moments, um, then you have a chance to do right, to, to change it, to turn it back on itself. 
Kwame does. There was a, a media explosion of poetry and performance, which was not unrelated to the politics of race, the politics of identity, the politics of class that has permeated the poetry world. And so there became this weird divide between what we call the performance poet and the page poet. The poets who were so-called performance poets were the, the crowd getters. People were responding to their work. People were responding to its spontaneity, its energy, and its incredible urgency. And these were often performers of color. Yet what the publishing world was doing was ignoring these performers. She is, a, is my primary example of someone who was able to take the enthusiasm of the stage and marry it to the craft and rigor on the page. American poetry kind of needed a slap in the face and kind of a grabbing by the collars and shaking from slam poetry. That's one way that Patricia Smith really is a, a, a path maker, a groundbreaker woman who has managed to move from within that to carry those two things that is the performance on the stage and the performance on the page um, with equal power and equal credibility so much so that she has completely erased that divide. The first book that Patricia published, Life According to Motown, when I discovered the book I was already in my 20s. I was a, a graduate student. If you asked enough poets of a certain generation, it would be on everybody's list. Like she really is a smith, like a blacksmith. She just is constantly making these poems. She's constantly redefining what the material can be. So she does guzzle, she does sonnet, she does this golden shovel poem. From the Western tradition, from the black tradition, and then the blues, and the way she uses R&B and finds in it formal practices in it. Patricia Smith is a poet who is acutely aware of form, of the different ways in which one can use, uh, can make a poem. And those dimensions that we see in her work show that that range and, 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 and that capacity. And, and one of the things that you cannot deny is that Patricia Smith's facility for formal practice is, is inimitable. It's actually uh, a mastery. And it culminates, of course, with Blood Dazzler and the success it has nationally. She brought voice to this natural disaster which took the lives of so many. So when you're looking at how Katrina affected, who Katrina affected, there were so many folks that were just erased. She uses the image to confront these very difficult issues, these terrifying scenes, so that we can understand them and and thus understand ourselves better. Homophobia, the economic devastation, body image issues. Gender, race, class, sexuality. She's a poet writing in the moment who explores all kinds of poetic forms, forcing us to understand what um, the, the broad and rich and varied and complex idea of what America is. Patricia Smith's subject is the African-American experience. Her experience is her the intimacy of her own life. Her themes come out of those things. Actually, it is in the details of the experience of the individual that we find a true universal affinity. I think Patricia Smith embodies that idea. Photos of Smith, smiling with students, family, and colleagues. Her career is very present tense to me. I think about the things that she's done in addition to being an amazing poet, which includes teaching, which includes raising a granddaughter, mentoring, maintaining relationships with poets all over the place. She is the person that opens the door for people like me, where you're always wondering if you're allowed to speak this way and, and if it will be accepted and if it's considered real poetry. Her accessibility, I think, makes the difference. She says, I'm aspiring to be the great poet of a truth that has come through me and to be faithful to that, to be faithful to the people I've met and I've seen. And in that simplicity, something complex and beautiful has emerged. And that gift, I think, will continue to move us and continue to challenge us. When I got the word that you had won this, uh, this Ruth Lilly Prize, I was not at all shocked. I am elated. This is the, the prize for, 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 for poets of color, for black poets in this country. And um, your success is our success. You deserve everything. You deserved everything for a long time. Thank you for, for allowing us to see ourselves through you, um, through the work that you encouraged us to do, you've given us permission to do. And I love you dearly.
Congratulations, man. It's a long time coming. <laughs> a black and white photograph of Patricia Smith smiling with her chin resting on her hand. A message appears in white text. Congratulations, Patricia Smith. I am Patricia Smith. I am most definitely a poet. And I am a female African-American, uh, she, her. I have short dark hair with light uh, red and light brown streaks. I'm wearing gold hoop earrings and a black top. I'm sitting on a leather couch uh, propped up by uh, a number of throw pillows. And behind the couch is a crammed bookshelf. First of all, thank you, Denez. I am so thrilled and so fortunate to move through a life that includes you. Thank you, Poetry Foundation, for gilding the path to this moment. And thank you, Ruth, for the wide dream that has shifted and transformed so many lives. I'd also like to thank the people who took time out from their storied and productive writing lives to speak on my behalf the inimitable Mahogany Brown, whose every lyric is synonymous with the magic Black women are, who has taught me everything I'll ever need to know about how to utterly own my sliver of this world. Kwame Dawes, now and forever, the hardest working man, not only in po biz, but in the very business of word. My mentor and trusted editor who badgered me to heights I had trouble imagining. Mr. Hayes, the Terrence, who astounds with his boundless talent, but who has steadied me throughout this journey with a friendship that is forever and unmoving. Tayamba Jess, he who breathes the blues, my colleague, my confidant, my shy town connection, who reminds me of the importance of root. Mark Smith, the originator of the poetry slam who was there at the beginning, who was the beginning, who blessed me every damn week with a sputtering mic and a boisterous audience. I don't think I've ever thanked you, Mark, for leading me to that cliff and nudging me forward until I had no choice but to leap. In fact, I owe gratitude to everyone who's touched this lifetime so far. Everyone who advised, encouraged, criticized, and cajoled me. Everyone who hired and fired me. Everyone who learned from my work, who spoke it aloud, who witnessed and questioned it. Everyone who cursed it, deemed it worthless, and slammed the books closed. So to the seventh grader, cowering in the shadows of the at the back of a classroom, living poetry, but too afraid to write it, thank you. Gwendolyn. Lucille, Nikki, thank you. Kave Khanum, thank you. To the grocery baggers, murderers, pump jockeys, booksellers, bass players, debutantes, angels, and lost souls who leaned forward in their seats at the green mill or got up in the middle of a poem because they just didn't get it, thank you. Guild Books, thank you. Michael War, thank you. Louis Rodriguez, thank you. To my family, Bruce and Michaela, who had to learn to live with me, a question mark, an agitated spirit, a midnight rambler, a mutterer to myself, thank you. Chicago, oh Chicago, thank you, thank you. To the voice within me that never stops saying, you know you're just that girl from the West Side, don't you? Thank you. I owe all of you everything for helping me nurture the second throat that I found, for teaching me to be an unrelenting witness and for convincing me once and for all that some people are born to be poets. And now I wanna do a poem from my father, Otis Douglas Smith the first person to ever call me a poet. When my father migrated to Chicago from Arkansas, he brought with him something I like to call the blues of the back porch, 
where we sat down every day and he told me wild stories about people who populated our world of the West Side. He taught me that there were other ways to look at the world beside what I was learning in school. When I was a kid, my mom told me that my father had wanted to give me the name Jimmy Savannah instead of the very, very structured and formal Patricia Ann Smith. And I never ever forgave my mother for not letting him have his way. And this is a poem about the woman who could have worn that name. My mother scraped the name Patricia Ann from the ruins of her discarded Delta, thinking it would offer me shield and shelter that leering men would skulk away at the slap of it. Her hands on the hips of Alabama, she went for flat and functional, then siphoned each syllable of drama, repeatedly crushing it with her broad practical tongue until it sounded like an instruction to God, not a name. She wanted a child of pressed head and knocking knees, a trip up in the double dutch swing, a starched pinafore and peppermint in the sour pickle kind of child, stiff laced, and unshakably fixed on salvation. Her, Patricia Ann, would never idly throat the Lord's name or wear one of those thin sparkled skirts that flirted with her knees. She'd be a nurse or third grade teacher or postal drone, jobs requiring alarm clock discipline and sensible shoes. My four downbeats were music enough for a vapid life of butcher shop sawdust and fatback as cuisine, for raids spritzed into the writhing pockets of a Murphy bed. No crinkled consonants or muted hiss would summon me. My daddy detested borders. One look at my mother's watery belly and he insisted as much as he could insist with her on the name Jimmy Savannah, seeking to bless me with the blues bathed moniker of a ball breaker, the name of a grown gal in a snug red dress and unlaced all stars. He wanted to shoot muscle through whatever I was called, arm each syllable with tiny weapons so that no one could mistake me for anything other than a tricky whisperer with a switchblade in my shoe. I was bound to be all legs, a bladed debutante hooked on lucky strikes and sugar. When I sent up prayers, God's boy would giggle and consider. Daddy didn't want me to be anybody's surefire factory, nobody's callback or seized rhythm, so he conjured a name so odd and hot even a boy could claim it. And yes, he was prepared for the look that my mother first gave him when he mouthed his choice. The look that said, that's it, Otis. You done lost your goddamned mind. She did that thing she does where she grows two full inches with righteous. And my daddy decided to whisper, love you, Jimmy Samana." whenever we were alone, re and rechristening me the seed of Otis, conjuring his own religion and naming it me. Congratulations again, Patricia. Now let's head to the chat. We'll also be dropping links to purchase some of Patricia's books. Thank you to all of tonight's awardees for their incredible and impactful work. Please join me in giving them one more big round of applause in the chat. Check out poetryfoundation.org where the video of tonight's event will be posted along with feature articles and other content related to our winners. At poetryfoundation.org forward slash events, you will see a full listing of the foundation's upcoming virtual readings, workshops, and programming for young people this fall. And finally, Thank you all for making the poetry landscape so vibrant and fulfilling. Hopefully, we will all be able to gather in person at the Poetry Foundation again soon. Please stay well, take care of yourselves and each other, and have a great night. Text appears. 
Thank you for joining us for the 2021 Pegasus Awards. Credits list permissions for book covers, photos, and poems used in this awards ceremony. Audio description produced by All Senses Go, with narration by Michael Herzovi.